No. I think we must be quiet if we can start. Thanks. Okay, you have a more convincing voice than mine. Thank you very much. Um, okay, I, I'd like to continue. Uh, we have, uh, we had uh, one and a half hours yesterday, another one and a half hours today. I want to continue with this nice picture. We, last week we were in Namibia with a family and this is actually a picture my son took <laughs> of a nice rainbow in the savannah. Um, so I want to recap a little bit first uh, what we talked about yesterday and then uh, I have a lot of material. I won't cover everything, but I want to, uh, there's a few important things that I still want to tell you about. Uh, so I will skip over quite a few things today. Uh, but I decided to still leave them in the slides be because I assume uh, you'll, you'll get the slides and then uh, you might want to look at some of the things uh, in detail afterwards, even if I don't talk about them. So uh, so we said we have uh, uh, one way to formalize a causal structure in terms of a, a structural equation model, uh, uh, which, which has a directed acyclic graph with random variables placed on the vertices of the graphs. And one way to get these random variables is to have a noise variable at each node and a function at each node which takes as input all the causal parents and the noise variable and produces an output uh, by applying the function. So uh, I also said that uh, uh, there's a certain particular type of uh, 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 factorization uh, of the density and this is related to something called the causal Markov condition. Uh, the density factorizes into uh, conditionals where the crucial thing here is in the conditions and today I can point with a mouse pointer so I think that's going to be useful for the people sitting on the side. The crucial thing about this factorization is that uh, here we only condition on the causal parents and so that could be a much lower dimensional uh, uh, factorization of the joint density and also these things here now uh, they are actually physical physical mechanisms so they are uh, causally meaningful, uh, uh, they're not just uh, uh, mathematical objects which you, you can write down all sorts of conditionals of variables given others. Most of them are physically meaningless, they're just mathematical objects, but these ones are actually physically meaningful. Um, so first thing is I want to tell you a little bit about the do notation. I think this already came up yesterday in the, in the panel discussion. Uh, and it's actually something very simple. Uh, nothing to be afraid of. I think Ferenc mentioned this yesterday that some of this stuff looks a little bit opaque, uh, but actually in the end it's not that complicated. Um, in a way, you already know everything you need to know about it. So first of all, so what's the do notation? This is how we write it. So it's the distribution of a variable given that some other variable is set to a fixed value. So we write it like this, or sometimes in short, like this. So the lowercase x is the particular value of the random variable uppercase x. Uh, and the most important thing about this thing is that it's different from the conditional. And uh, we can compute all these things uh, if we have the joint distribution and the graph. Uh, so once again, so what is the difference between uh, a conditional and a do probability, so one example. So let's say we consider the probability uh, that uh, you guys, uh, uh, so or, or any arbitrary MLSS particip participant can get an ICML paper accepted. So let's say this is a 50% probability. Um, now let's look an at another probability, uh, a do probability. And this is the probability that anyone, uh, 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 some arbitrary person, can get an ICML paper accepted after we make them participate in MLSS. So I think you'll all uh, uh, appreciate that probably these two probabilities are uh, quite different uh, because probably uh, whether or not you become an MLSS participant already uh, says something about what you know about machine learning. So there was probably a non-trivial application process. Not everybody got in, you made it in. So you're already uh, maybe to begin with, more likely to get in. So these two numbers will be different and we'll look a little bit into this and how they're different. Okay, so how do we uh, compute a do probability? So we take the joint distribution, we take the graph, we write down our favorite factorization, which is the causal factorization, where uh, uh, over here we have one conditional for each of the variables. So this is a product from one through n one condition for each of a variable and it's a conditional uh, uh, given its causal parents. Uh, 
So now uh, we are going to, and each of those corresponds to one of the structural equations. Now we're going to replace uh, one of those conditions or one of the structural equations uh, simply by, uh, uh, rather than computing that variable as a function of its parents in the noise, we'll just set it to a fixed value. So that's the simplest form of intervention, uh, a fixed value. And uh, uh, so probabilistically, one way to do this is we replace this conditional with a delta distribution. So this is a, a point mass uh, which is uh, zero everywhere except if uh, uh, the random variable xi takes the value lowercase xi. So, and I'm not going to worry now about whether this has a density or not. Uh, so that's just the, the delta, delta measure. Yeah? Okay, so we substitute this. Um, that means we have uh, this term and all the remaining ones. Uh, now, uh, the next thing is we integrate out xi. So we sum over xi, this one. Um, and then we basically simply drop that term uh, from this uh, uh, product here. So we have now a product over all the remaining ones. So effectively, what we've done, we we've just uh, uh, dropped this term. Uh, we've dropped the dependence on this thing. And wherever we had the uppercase xi, we substituted the value lowercase xi. And uh, if we are interested in other kinds of dual probabilities, so this one still has n minus 1 terms on the left-hand side, we can continue and marginalize out more stuff. So, and I'll show you one, one example. But before we go through one example in more detail, uh, let's just look at a few examples, uh, uh, maybe starting with examples uh, of cases where the dual probability coincides with the conditional probability. And, and this is basically in, in all the cases where uh, all the dependence between x and y is due to the, uh, the, the causal influence of x on y. So if the causal influence on x of x on y explains all the dependence, so whether it's a direct or indirect causal influence, then the due probability will coincide with the conditional. And uh, I don't go through this in detail, but I recommend as a simple exercise Afterwards, you, you j just take this, uh, take this definition, how it works, and apply it to these cases. So you write down the causal factorization of this graph, etc. Uh, it's in all of these cases, maybe two lines. So here it coincides. In this case, it coincides. In this case, it also coincides. Uh, let's look at a few examples where it does not coincide. So here we have an example where x and y are correlated because y is, uh, has a causal influence on x. In this case, if you go through the algebra, you will simply see that the due probability of y given that we intervene on x, or, or maybe first start intuitively, imagine we intervene on x, what difference does this make for the distribution of y? Uh, it makes no difference because x doesn't have a cause or influence on y. And if you go through the formalism, then it turns out that due probability y given due x uh, will be equal to the marginal over y. So y just doesn't care about whether you set uh, x to some value or not. And you can also, you can always alternatively think of it in terms of structural equation models. And obviously in, in a structural equation model uh, for this kind of causal graph, we would have y being equal to a function of its noise variable and its parents. It doesn't have parents, so y is simply a, a function of its noise variables. Um, so it doesn't, e it doesn't depend on x at all. So whatever you do to x cannot make a difference here to y. Uh, another example where the due probability does not coincide with the conditional is uh, the one down here. Also down here, if you calculate p of y given to x, uh, you will find that it's actually equal to the marginal p of y. So again, uh, this is because uh, uh, x doesn't have an influence, a causal influence on y. So now let's look at one particular case, which turns out to be a well-known case uh, uh, that uh, is, I think nobody would claim this is, a, uh, uh, this is uh, special to the graphical approach to causality, but I think it's a nice example that shows how this graphical language uh, uh, works and how it gives you uh, sensible, uh, sensible and useful special cases. Uh, and, and here we will get to something which is called the adjust adjustment formula, which is used all the time. Um, and it follows directly, uh, trivially, from the, the two calculus. So here, uh, imagine we have uh, this causal graph here. So this often, often uh, uh, occurs in, 
uh, in medicine, but it also occurs in uh, online advertising in, in uh, all sorts of applications. Uh, so we have a treatment X. Uh, y is whether the patient recovers or not. And Z is a confounder that influences uh, both the recovery and the choice of treatment. So for instance, there's a, a famous example, uh, uh, kidney stones. So there's some, some kind of, imagine uh, people have uh, kidney stones and there's two types of treatments. One is some kind of minimally invasive surgery uh, and another one is an uh, open surgery, which is more complicated. Uh, now it turns out if you look uh, overall at the, the average recovery rate, uh, uh, so at the conditional probability of recovery given the treatment, then it turns out that uh, people are more likely to recover with a minimally invasive surgery than uh, with this with a more uh, uh, complicated surgery, um, which would seem to suggest that we should perform the minimally invasive surgery. However, then if you look at the details, uh, uh, among, uh, so there's a confounder which is the size of the kidney stone and it turns out that doctors, uh, if the kidney stones are large, they are more likely to do the larger surgery than for small kidney stones and uh, larger kidney stones uh, uh, again uh, also have an influence on the probability of recovery. So the larger kidney stones make it less likely that a person recovers. So now if we look in detail, uh, given the size of the kidney stone, if we only look at patients with large kidney stones, then it turns out um, that they are more likely to recover with a larger surgery. And the same is true for the patients with the small kidney stones. So if you look at these two populations separately, then it turns out both of them would benefit from the larger surgery. Uh, but due to the fact that the easy patient group with the small stones in this population was more likely to receive the minimally invasive surgery, it looks as if the minimal invasive surgery is better. So uh, let's go through this uh, in, uh, in, a, in a bit more detail. Um, so here um, we have the treatment, this is the surgery. Uh, here we have the recovery and this is the size of the stones that influences both of them. So we start with the causal factorization of this graph. Uh, so simply uh, for each variable we have one conditional. Uh, the conditional over Z doesn't, it's not conditioned on anything because Z doesn't have parents. So this is the one over Z, this is the one for X. X has uh, one causal parent which is Z and this is the conditional for Y and Y has two causal parents X and Z. So now we are going to intervene on X. So we want to know uh, uh, if we actively choose treatment A versus B, uh, how does this affect uh, whether they recover or not? So in the end, we're interested in the probability of recovery given that we choose treatment A versus we choose treatment B. So it's not given that we observe that a patient has undergone treatment A or B, but it's uh, given that we choose treatment A versus B. So that's the crucial difference. This is what we're interested in, in the end. So we want to do X. Uh, so that means we have to replace the, uh, the conditional that we have for X, which in this case is conditional P of X given Z. So X only depends on Z. We replace this with a delta distribution. So first I just substitute the delta distribution for this conditional here. Then I integrate out X. So then the uh, thing doesn't depend on X anymore. Uh, this thing drops out. And now finally, I, st I still have this uh, uh, dependence on the X Z here, which I don't want. In the end, I'm interested in P of Y given to X. So I marginalize over Z uh, to get this formula here. So I just take this thing, integrate over Z. Um, and uh, then what you can see here is, uh, uh, here now we have, uh, we consider the probability uh, of uh, recovery given uh, the size of the stones uh, and the treatment. And so we, we now uh, consider, so basically we, do we sum this over Z. Uh, so we have two terms. One is uh, this term for small kidney stones. So we look for called small kidney stones. Uh, what is the probability of recovery? Uh, we multiplies, multiply by the probability that uh, people have small kidney stones to begin with. Um, and then we do the same thing for the population that has the large kidney stones. So this is, uh, 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 we're basically now adjusting for the size of the kidney stones. Um, or sometimes people will say we control for the size of the kidney stones. 
And uh, this can give very different results uh, from the conditional. So it can be that, the, as I mentioned before, it, it can happen that the conditional uh, uh, favors, uh, seems to favor one treatment, whereas in both populations, <coughs> so both of these components here, actually favor uh, the other treatment. And this is also this is something called Simpson's paradox. Uh, it happens uh, uh, all the time. Uh, if you've never read about Simpson's paradox, I, I recommend that you read about it. It's a well-known paradox. Most people talk about it without talking about causality. But from my point of view, uh, it's actually, uh, and, and not just from my point of view, uh, for people who are into causality, I'd say this is the right way to think of Simpson's paradox. Okay. So, uh, this is uh, one of the things that would be nice if you remember from this tutorial. Causality has something to do with controlling for variables, uh, and this can be a useful thing in all sorts of uh, applications, all sorts of uh, fallacies of common sense, etc. Uh, benefit if you think about them causally. Um, now, uh, 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 talking about inferring, I want to say a little bit about uh, graph inference, but I don't want to go into, into detail on it because I have, uh, I have too much material today and I, and I rather want to tell you something about some other stuff as well. Uh, but I do want to at least uh, explain this concept of deseparation. Okay, and I, I want to maybe not do everything formally, but give you an intuition for what's, what's going on. Okay. So, uh, deseparation, I'll, I'll first uh, give you the, the definition and then uh, the intuition. Um, okay, so we consider paths in our graph. We have our directed uh, acyclic graph uh, and we consider paths and we don't care about the errors uh, for the moment. And then uh, we introduce what it means for a path to be blocked. Um, and then we'll say uh, a certain set of nodes will deseparate two other sets in the graph. And this is our notation. So this notation looks a little bit like conditional independence. And in the end, it will be something that's closely related to conditional independence. That's the beauty of it. Uh, so it's a graphical criterion which will tell us something about conditional independence. Um, uh, so in the end, we'll say uh, uh, Z deseparates X and Y if Z blocks every path from an arbitrary node in X to an arbitrary node in Y. Okay, and what does it mean to block a path? There, there are uh, two ways uh, a path can be blocked, and, uh, and there's a logical OR in between, so at least one of those ways has to hold true. Uh, if the set Z should block uh, 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 the paths, uh, the one option is that there is a chain so where the arrows go in the same direction, or a fork, which looks like this, uh, such that the middle node, M, is in the blocking set, Z. So that's one way, so one example here, uh, X and Y uh, will be blocked by uh, taking either Z or U into the conditioning set. Uh, so because this is a chain, this is in the set, it gets blocked. And, uh, and the intuition here is, uh, we have some information here in the noise variable of x, and this information uh, wants to, or you, you want to find out if this information can flow to y. Uh, but if you condition on any of these nodes in between, this flow will be stopped, so the information from here cannot flow to here. Okay, and the second way is a little bit more subtle. The uh, second way in, in which uh, a path uh, uh, um, can be blocked or unblocked, uh, right now I should say blocked, uh, is. Uh so if the path, so in this if the path only contains chains or forks, then it's easy. Then you just have to check whether any of those nodes along the way is in the conditioning set. Now it gets more tricky if a path contains a collider. So a collider means uh, uh, that there's an element in between which is uh, sort of caused from left and right. Uh, in this case, we actually want uh, for the blocking to work. Uh, we want this middle node not to be in the conditioning set. I think if you have heard of graphical models, this same notion appears there, and this is, of course, about graphical models. So you want the middle node not to be in the conditioning set, and also you don't want any descendant of the middle node to be in the conditioning set. Okay, so let's uh, look at an example of that. So here, um, 
we how can we p block this path between x and y? Well, we could take u into the uh, conditioning set, then the path is blocked, and we don't have to look any further. But now let's assume u is not in the conditioning set, then we have to see what happens here. Uh, if uh, z and w are also not in the conditioning set, we're fine, nothing can go wrong. So overall, the empty set blocks, uh, separates x from y. Uh, but if z is in the conditioning set, so if only z, or only w, or only those two, but not this one, are in the conditioning set, then things can go wrong. And uh, I'll show you an example in the next slide. So somehow conditioning, uh, this, even though the information from here doesn't flow all the way through here, and this one doesn't normally flow through here, if you condition on this, somehow then the knowledge of, of this distribution or of something about distribution, this distribution, together with the value of this, suddenly tells you something about this distribution. And uh, one famous example of this is uh, uh, Bergson's paradox. And uh, we can maybe briefly go through this. Uh, so uh, uh, this is already quite old, uh, uh, 70 years old. Uh, uh, and here for a simple example, let's take binary variables x, y, z. Um, and uh, uh, this is also related to, to Reichenbach's uh, uh, principle. Uh, I'll tell you about this in a minute. So let's assume in our setting uh, that we consider a population of politicians and let's assume a priori there's no correlation between whether a politician is a good speaker uh, and, and uh, whether the politician is intelligent. So let's assume this is true. Now uh, there's a certain selection process going on. Some politicians are successful and it requires certain skills. In, in this very simple model, uh, our model uh, will be that a politician is successful if x all true holds true. So the post politician has to be at least a good speaker or at least intelligent. Could be, could be both, but if both of them fail, then the politician is not going to be successful. So here, uh, uh, Z now characterizes whether, whether a politician is successful. And then the funny thing is that in this population of successful politicians, suddenly there will be a negative correlation between being a good speaker and being intelligent because somehow you've removed all the, the politicians uh, which are neither, so you're only left with this population where at least one of them holds true. And, uh, and I guess we use this in practice also. If, if you see someone who's a very good speaker, then you're, you're likely to think, yeah, I, I think he, he or she only made it because he's such a good speaker. Uh, so uh, that kind of explains away uh, intelligence, uh, or it doesn't, uh, it makes it plausible that intelligence wasn't necessary. So uh, there's a negative correlation, which means that suddenly x and y are dependent. So that means you, uh, correlation means uh, knowing the distribution of y tells me something about knowing, knowing the distribution of x, uh, even though it looks like no information can flow. So in such a collider, information can flow only uh, given uh, knowledge about the value of the colliding variable or of some other downstream variable. I guess you can, you can believe that if this one isn't observed, but some downstream thing, then we still have some information about it. And that then also effectively couples these two quantities. Okay, so that's the, uh, this uh, principle. Let's see. So again, if we look at this path, uh, this path can be blocked. Uh, if u is in the conditioning set, we have to look no further. This blocks it. Um, but it can also be uh, blocked if u is not in the conditioning set, and in this case it's simply blocked if none of those two is in this in set, because this collider, if it's not observed, and if nothing downstream is observed, it blocks it, and you don't even have to condition on it. Okay, so now we have a graphical criterion, uh, which can get, uh, can get more tricky in complicated graphs, but in principle it's, uh, it's straightforward. Um, and maybe also uh, one other, uh, so just to finish on this Bergson paradox. Uh, so I told you about the Reichenbach principle. The Reichenbach principle was saying we, if we find two variables uh, that uh, uh, we find to be dependent, so independence does not hold true, uh, then this must be explained by a third variable that causally influences both of them. Uh, so this was uh, 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 sort of uh, 
maybe not completely the whole story, because as you just saw, there can be cases that if we condition on something else, then this generates a dependence between x and y. So this talks about the case where we don't condition on something else, but uh, if we have such a setting, such a, sometimes this is called a selection bias, uh, in such a setting like in Bergson's, para Bergson's paradox, then x and y can become dependent by conditioning. So here, so if we look at these simple graphs, if you invert both arrows, uh, no, sorry, if you invert the structure of this, yeah, effectively invert both arrows, so in here the arrows both go into z and here they both come out of z. So here we have marginal independence but conditional dependence. Here we have marginal independence but conditional dependence. Okay, so I think, uh, so here I have another example, but I think I won't go through this. I, I think you get the, the principle. Um, so yeah, maybe just a few notes about time ordering. Sometimes people are interested in uh, time ordering. Um, so time ordering doesn't solve the problem of causality. It gives you some information, but it can be also misleading. Uh, so here, for instance, I assume there's two variables that you observe and one of them takes place in time earlier than the other one. So these two variables, let's, let's assume they are dependent on each other. So we are willing to hypothesize there's something causal going on, we don't know what it is. And one of them happens early on time. So that excludes, so remember Reichenbach, so Reichenbach was saying two variables are dependent. Uh, that means there are three possibilities. Uh, x causes y, y causes x, or something else causes both x and y. So if uh, x tames, takes place in time earlier than y, then the possibility of x causing y, uh, sorry, if x takes place earlier than y, then the probability of y causing x is excluded by physics. Uh, but we still have two options left. It could be that x causes y, or it could be there's a confounder that causes both of them. Uh, and, and that confounder would have to be early on time if it's a temporal thing, but uh, it, can it can act with different time delays. Uh, and a nice example, uh, uh, which uh, uh, my collaborator uh, Kenji Fukumisi uh, came up with this one, is uh, that a barometer uh, uh, often falls before it rains, uh, but that doesn't mean, and, and, and there's a correlation between the value of the barometer and whether there's going to be rain, but of course the barometer falling does not cause the rain. So the conclusion is that time order makes the problem slightly easier. It rules out certain, certain causal structures, but it doesn't solve it. And, and usually in practice, uh, confounding often happens. So in a way, the hardest case is still there. Um, there's a, a, a well-known uh, notion which is called Granger causality. Um, uh, in Granger causality, we have uh, two time series, so variables that change over time. So we can model this by having a random variable for each time point. And, uh, and you want to find out whether one of those causes the other one. Now you can go through the whole thing. So, when, so the, the idea of Granger was uh, to say that uh, X uh, has a causal influence on Y um, uh, if X helps in predicting the future of Y from its past. So you can always try to predict uh, the next value of Y from its past values. And the question now is, does it help you to additionally use uh, the past of X uh, when doing this prediction? And Granger would say, or did say, uh, if, if that's the case, then I will say that X Granger causes Y. Um, and uh, uh, I'm not going to go through details, but actually the, this uh, story, you can equivalent to this intuition, you can derive uh, or you can express in terms of the separation and condi conditional independence structure. So it's, a, if you want, it's a special case of what I just told you about for the last 10 minutes, only that Granger came up with this uh, directly. And uh, uh, Granger, so this is, uh, sometimes people criticize this notion by saying it doesn't work when there's confounding. Uh, actually, and one should say that Granger was already aware of this. He didn't, uh, 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 he wasn't so naive that he uh, claimed that this would always work. And the confounding uh, is basically the same problem that we just had. You can have a confounder that causes both of these time series uh, with different time delays. And if that's the case, it could look as if 
the time series x uh, causes the time series y because uh, the information that you measure in x will will occur later on in the time series of y. So uh, Granger causality is, is a very nice method, uh, but it has its limitations when there is confounding. Um, maybe I'm going to skip this. Uh, oops. And uh, I, I briefly want to say a few words about uh, uh, quantifying causal inferences. So, so sometimes uh, people in Granger causality use uh, a notion called transfer entropy uh, to to measure the strength of causal influence. And uh, we we thought a little bit about this problem of quantifying causal influences. And I I won't go into it in great detail, but I just want to sort of briefly mention what this is about. And if you're interested, you can read it in detail. We have a paper uh, f uh, a few years ago in the Annals of Statistics about this. So, um, okay, so the idea, so we have uh, a known uh, causal DAG, uh, directed acyclic graph, we have a known joint distribution, and uh, the problem now is we want to have some sensible measure of the causal strength from node i to j. And uh, uh, the way we, we went about this problem was uh, that we thought of some reasonable postulates and tried to come up with a measure that satisfies these postulates. Uh, the first postulate is, uh, for this trivial graph that only contains x and y, we would like the measure of causal strength to be equal to the mutual information between x and y. Um, it kind of makes sense. There's no other path from, from x to y. This is the only one, so the whole dependence is uh, caused by this, by this arrow. Second postulate is one of locality. Uh, the measure should be such that whatever happens uh, upstream of x or downstream of y should not change uh, the, the quantity, the dependence between uh, the, the causal strength from x to y. Um, the third one is maybe a slightly more subtle. Um, it turned out to be a reasonable requirement to say that the uh, measure of causal strength should be lower bounded by the conditional mutual information in a setting like this. In fact, it's, it's even tempting to sometimes consider uh, con a mutual, uh, conditional mutual information as a measure, but that turns out to be a bad idea um, because uh, this setting here uh, contains this one here as a as limiting special case if this uh, influence gets weaker and weaker and this one now is already covered by our, our uh, requirement of locality so in this case uh, we want to get this measure of causal strength so that's also a requirement and then just finally very briefly the idea of how we handle this is that we uh, we produce a, a, a different graph where we cut this link and uh, Instead, uh, we feed in an IID copy that has the same marginal distribution as this one into Y. So this gives us a, a, a special uh, a distribution which we call P sub X causing Y. And then our measure of causal strength for this arrow will be the uh, KL divergence, divergence between the original distribution and this mutilated distribution where we feed in the IID copy. So we measure the strength of this arrow by uh, measuring how much it changes the overall thing if we remove it. So uh, again, this was just very brief. Um, maybe also to tell you there are lots of interesting uh, open problems because I don't want to claim we have solved this problem, but I think it's, a, it's an interesting uh, issue. Okay, so now uh, about uh, graph inference. I don't want to go into great details on this, but give you a few basic basic ideas. And uh, one of the ideas that I already mentioned uh, briefly yesterday is the idea of faithfulness. Um, so remember, first of all, that uh, the, the Markov condition that I already briefly mentioned yesterday, um, so I, I yesterday I, I, I especially mentioned the, the local causal Markov condition, so that means uh, a node is independent of its non-descendants when conditioned on its parents. Right? So the parents uh, shield the node from all non-descendants, if you want. That was the local condition. Um, now it turns out uh, this immediately implies a global Markov condition, and the global Markov condition is now expressed in terms of deseparation. 
it contains uh, the other one as a special case, but the statement in terms of these separations says that um, if x and y, the set x, so that could be a set of variables, and y is also a set of variables, if these two sets are deseparated by the set uh, z, so the set z contains any, uh, uh, blocks any possible path between a member of x and a member of y. So this is now the notion of deseparation. If this deseparation holds true, then it follows that uh, the corresponding statement holds true for a conditional independence. So this is a property, the interesting thing is this is a property of the graph, and this is a property of the joint distribution. Now, of course, the joint distribution, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, carries a footprint of the graph, uh, because the, 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 the noises, if you think of it as a structural equation model, there are noises uh, that we feed in at every node. The noises are jointly independent, and then they, they pick up dependencies according to the topology of the graph as they th spread through things. And so the entailed distribution, uh, P, uh, carries a footprint or carries information about the topology of the graph, and this is exactly uh, encapsulated in this statement. So deseparation, graph theoretic dissipation, implies uh, the uh, 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 conditional independence for exactly the same sets, X, Y, Z. Um, so this means uh, the distribution carries a footprint of the graph. Now we want to actually infer in the other direction. We want to uh, observe the distribution, maybe make some conditional independence tests, and then infer back uh, to say something about the graph. So we really need this implication in the opposite direction. And uh, uh, this is uh, 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 encoded in this uh, notion of faithfulness. So we will say that, or uh, this is the definition of Spurtus uh, 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 Climor and Shinas uh, from CMU uh, in the philosophy department. Uh, they said that uh, we will call a distribution faithful with respect to the graph uh, if only those independences hold true that are implied by the Markov condition. So if only those independences hold true that uh, uh, must hold true uh, for graphical reasons already. Now, in practice, it could be that you have a graph uh, that, uh, uh, so the graph implies a set of conditional independences. There might be some additional conditional independences that can be observed in practice uh, if you do your testing, uh, just because certain paths cancel out each other. Uh, so uh, these guys say this is unlikely and uh, we are willing to assume it doesn't happen uh, in order to be able to, to do inference. And um, without going through the algebra, just uh, sort of to give you the idea why this can happen. So this is a, a simple uh, linear system here where you have, uh, you start with X. Uh, it has a causal influence on Z directly, but also indirectly via Y. And uh, uh, we have linear equations here everywhere. And it turns out if the coefficients uh, satisfy a certain uh, linear uh, equation, then in the end, x can be independent of z, so even though x causes z, but there are two different paths and they can be such that they cancel each other, then x becomes independent of z. And, uh, uh, and this, is some, this is a particular kind of uh, independence. It's a conditional independence by a special case where there's a conditioning set is empty, uh, and it's, uh, it's an independence that's not implied by the graph. If you just look at the graph, you would not infer that this independence holds true. So this is an example of a non-faithful uh, or unfaithful distribution. And, uh, and you can think of many other, uh, many other examples. So now uh, the idea will be we assume, uh, uh, we assume that these statements both hold true. So we have the Markov condition and we have faithfulness. So that means this thing here becomes equivalent to this one. Uh, and then we'll just have to uh, uh, go about uh, testing from conditional independencies and see what this uh, implies about the graph. Um, and uh, in practice, now this, uh, uh, so, uh, so if we do this in the end, it will typically not lead to a unique graph, but it will lead uh, to a equivalence class. So if we know all the conditional independences about the distribution, uh, usually this is these are still consistent with multiple graphs, and that's called a Markov equivalence class. And uh, there's a nice characterization uh, of uh, whether two uh, graphs are Markov equivalent or, or not. Uh, and it's, uh, this characterization says they are uh, equivalent 
if and only if they have the same skeleton. So the skeleton is the graph that you get if you delete all the uh, arrowheads, you just uh, make them undirected links. So if they have the same skeleton and the same V structures, so V structures are cases where there's uh, two nodes that uh, together cause a node Y uh, and that are not married to each other. X and Y don't have a link, but both of them cause Y. So uh, I think I will not go into great detail now, uh, so maybe just briefly some examples. So for instance, these uh, three uh, graphs are Markov equivalent because they have the same skeleton. If you remove the arrowheads, you have all the links, same links everywhere. Uh, they have the same V structures because they have no V structures at all. Uh, now there's a fourth possible graph here when X causes Y and Z causes Y. In that case, you would have a V structure <coughs> at Y and that's why that, that fourth graph is not Markov equivalent to these three. Uh, some more examples of Markov equivalent DAGs. And then uh, I won't go through that, but there are several uh, algorithms that now uh, think about how to efficiently test for all possible conditional independencies and how should you do that uh, such that it doesn't uh, completely blow up and, uh, and then uh, uh, lead you uh, to a class in, uh, to, to these uh, uh, graphs that are consistent with the conditional independences. Uh, so I leave this in the slides, but I won't go uh, through that because it's a little tedious. Uh. Okay. Uh, also, one other thing that I have left in the slides that I but I don't want to go through now is uh, the proof that the different uh, Markov conditions are equivalent. So, just to tell you the statement, I think I already briefly mentioned it yesterday. Uh, so the following uh, four conditions are equivalent. Uh, number one is the existence of a structural causal model or functional causal model. So this model where we have a function sitting on each node, the function takes as inputs, the values of the parents and the noise variable. Uh, so this, as I mentioned, gives right to rise to a graphical model. Um, <coughs> number two is uh, the local causal Markov condition. So each node is independent of its non-descendants when conditioned on its parents. Number three is the global causal Markov condition in, uh, expressed in terms of deseparation. Uh, and number four is the causal factorization of the joint distribution. Uh, so all four of those are equivalent, but the structural causal model doesn't have to be unique here. Okay, and I'll leave the proof in the slides. Uh, and uh, instead, uh, move uh, to a particular case that I think is particularly interesting from a machine learning point of view and it which also was uh, important for us when we moved into this field. Uh, and that's the special case where we only have two variables because uh, everything that I said before, of course, uh, this these methods here that are based on faithfulness, wait, where do we have it? So whatever is based on faithfulness uh, is in the end based uh, on uh, conditional independence testing. And if you want to do conditional independence testing, you can only do non-trivial conditional independence testing if you have at least three variables. So uh, you need X, Y, and Z. Uh, and uh, uh, what happens if you have only two variables? So what happens if you have two variables and you just want to decide which is cause, which is effect? then uh, you are lost with this method. You have to think of something else. And it turns out this something else that you then can think of uh, should actually be useful uh, also in the more in these uh, settings where we, ha we do have three or more variables. So in a way, restricting ourselves to three or more variables uh, hides some of the difficulty of a problem uh, because it, it lets you do conditional independence testing. But uh, we believe now that there's also causal signals in settings where we only have two variables and these causal signals should always be useful. Okay. Okay. So we have we have a structural causal model, jointly independent noises, uh, this entails a distribution with conditional independencies 
uh, it does not work for graphs that have only two vertices. And this is independent of whether we have uh, finite data or infinite data. And uh, we will try to solve this problem more in a machine learning style, because in machine learning, we, we know that we always have to make assumptions about function classes. We need some kind of priors, or we need regularization. Uh, and uh, uh, this is something that we now want to do here as well. And the two-variable problem is actually uh, an old problem, uh, for instance, mentioned here by the philosopher Nietzsche. It's the error of mistaking cause for consequence. And he calls it, uh, it's, it's number one among these in his list of the four great errors. Uh, he says there's no more, no more dangerous error and it's reason's intrinsic form of corruption. Now let's first see uh, uh, how difficult this problem is or what kind of assumptions we will need to solve this problem. So let's consider as a special case a structural equation model or a structural causal model that has only two variables. There's only one uh, possibility uh, of an error. I mean, it can go from x to y or from y to x, or it cannot be there, which is boring. So let's assume for simplicity, uh, without loss of generality, the error goes from x to y. Um, so this is our DAG. Uh, now, uh, we have noise variables that we usually don't plot. But basically, if this is a DAG, it means that x is a function of its parents and it no its noise variable. Now, it doesn't have parents. It only has a noise variable. So x is a function of its noise variable. Uh, actually, we can directly identify x with this noise variable. We never, never look at the noise variable itself. So let's just say x is a random variable to begin with. Okay. Um, now x then has a causal inference in y, which means that y is going to be a function of its parents. That's only x and its noise variable. Um, so y will be a function of x and noise. And uh, also, we, since we always as, as assume that all noise variables are jointly independent, and we have actually identified x with its noise variable, uh, then this assumption of joint independence of the noise terms will simply mean that x itself, uh, which plays the role of its noise variable, will be independent of the noise variable that influences y. So our model now will say uh, x is any random variable, and y is f of x and n, and there's an independence between x and the noise variable. So it's just a special case. Now uh, let's think about what kind of models can be implemented by this. We have no restrictions whatsoever on what are the functions, what is the domain of the noise variables, etc. So one particular thing that we could implement with this is we could say, uh, let's, uh, it's even a simple case because we'll, we'll make n uh, discrete, a discrete random variable that randomly switches between d different values and d is some finite number. So that means, uh, uh, so d switches between n different variables, values. There's no restriction on f. So uh, we could have a uh, setting where effectively n switches between d different functions f, which now depend only on x, right? So, so this uh, two-dimensional function f can be thought of in this setting uh, as a set of functions f1 through fd, uh, which are selected by the random variable n, but which otherwise could be arbitrarily different. So intuitively, I think it's clear that this is extremely hard. We don't observe n. Uh, and switches uh, between an arbitrary number of different functions. And in practice, uh, n could even be, it doesn't have to be a discrete variable, it can be a continuous variable. And there's no restrictions so far that f has to be even uh, continuous as a function of n or anything like that. So I think you will all believe this is an unsolvable uh, problem, problem effectively. Uh, and it's unsolvable because of this very complex way in which f can depend on n. So now what's the easiest way to reduce the complexity with which f can depend on n? Let's just say we'll make the noise additive, okay? So now uh, we specialize to this setting here, away from this. And it turns out in this case, the problem suddenly becomes solvable in the generic case. So now the problem of uh, identifiability, so whether we can uh, uh, decide on the causal direction from data, uh, becomes the following. We assume that our uh, uh, joint distribution of p of x, y is generated by such 
uh, structural equation model. So now y is an additive function here. Uh, still, uh, the input x is independent of the noise acting on y. Um, so let's assume this is the true model and then ask the question, uh, uh, when is it the case that a given joint distribution of x and y can be explained, uh, uh, so a given joint distribution that was generated like this can also be explained by a backward model of the same form. So could we flip the roles of x and y and still explain the, the, the joint distribution? And uh, it turns out the answer is generically we cannot, and I'll try to give you an intuition for this. So let's assume this is now the forward model, x is the cause, y is the effect. Uh, and we have some, y is some nonlinear function of x. So y is a function of x, uh, sorry, here, uh, plus noise, and let for simplicity, let's assume, so this noise has to be independent of x, and let's for simplicity assume this noise has bounded range. So then the way it's going to look like is this. Uh, this is the function of x, and then we add some noise of bounded range. Uh, this noise is independent of x, so in particular the range is going to be the same everywhere here along this x-axis. So it will look like this. We have this function, there's this uh, sort of slab or this noise region around which has the same width everywhere. Now if we take this joint distribution generated by this model, so the distribution is everything between these lines now, uh, and we try to explain it with a backward model. So now imagine that this is the input and this is the output. Then you will suddenly notice it's no longer possible to explain this thing here with a noise that's now, so this noise sigma prime cannot be independent of y because the width of this thing will depend on where we measure it. And this will depend on it exactly if we have a nonlinear function, yes. So what if f is linear? Yeah, if f is linear, you can do it. So that's, that's going to be uh, one special case that becomes non-identifiable, non yeah. Okay, and I won't go through this one in detail. So this is the, the general uh, condition. Um, uh, it sort of basically, it will say in the generic case, unless uh, these things are tuned to each other, so unless this function and the distribution of x, the distribution of noise are related to each other in a special case, uh, then uh, uh, the model becomes identifiable and one special case where it's not identifiable will be that the function is linear and the noise is Gaussian. And this was already known before. Um, but uh, the nice thing, so people knew also that if you have a linear model and the noise is non-Gaussian, it does become identifiable. Uh, the cool thing is uh, uh, if the model is non-linear, suddenly you can also solve, uh, the, uh, solve it for Gaussian noise. So in a way, uh, it helps you to be non-linear in this case. Okay, I won't go, won't go through the proof, and uh, maybe just maybe just briefly tell you uh, how one would apply this in practice. Uh, basically, uh, what we do is we have a data set, for instance, such as this one. We've seen this already: altitude versus temperature. Now we regress temperature and altitude first, uh, find a regression, and then we look at the residual noises, uh, which are plotted here. And then we do an independence test. We check whether these residual noises are independent uh, from the input variable. And then in this case, I don't know if you're good at detecting independence from looking at distributions. This is a reasonably uh, independent, uh, this distribution factorizes reasonably well. Whereas if you do the same thing in the opposite direction, now you consider temperature input, altitude as output, then you will find a noise structure that looks like this. And I think you can already see with your bare eyes that there's a strange dependence. Uh, this is not quite vertical, etc. So one can apply this and uh, it works reasonably well. So, it's so there is a signal uh, there uh, that allows you to decide between cause and effect. Okay, and when one can generalize, so if we are willing to make this assumption, this additive noise assumption, it also uh, simplifies the, the, the case where you have n variables, and this is again something that I won't go into details. Uh, in this case, um, so it makes the two variable case solvable, which means that in the two variable case where the Markov equivalence class simply consists of both graphs, it picks one of the elements of the class, 
uh, but also in the n variable case, uh, this kind of method can distinguish between Markov equivalent there, so that's that's nice. Uh, and in the n variable case, basically, you have to look at all the residuals uh, that you get and, uh, and do a joint independence test. Okay, so here's another uh, uh, sort of side note, which I think is interesting. So what can go wrong if we do this thing here? Well, uh, if you do the regression of temperature and altitude, uh, then of course there's an issue of how you regularize or whether you overfit or not, because if you take a very complex model, maybe you can perfectly interpolate all these points, uh, in which case the residual errors are zero and there's nothing to test for independence. Yeah? Um, so strictly speaking, and, and we have a, a theory paper about this with the summary potufe, um, you, could, you could split uh, data sets um, but um, uh, we've, we've also worked on this uh, method, which so you don't want to overfit uh, and, and maybe you don't even want to necessarily find a solution that minimizes the error. Maybe what you want to find is uh, a regression uh, which is such that the residual errors become independent rather than being small in a mean squared sense or something like that. So we, uh, we worked on a method like this. Um, uh, it's, more, it's, a, it's a more generic uh, criteria and it doesn't require that you assume particular noise distribution. And I think also philosophically it's interesting because it kind of means I want to, do, I want to regress Y on X such that in the errors that are left after the regression there's no information left about X. Yeah? So I want a regression such that the, the errors are independent of the input which kind of means I'm trying to find an explanation of Y in terms of X, which uses all information that's there in the Xs. So in the residual errors, there should be no information left. So maybe it's also interesting from this point of view. Um, anyway, so in this algorithm, we, we try to do that and, uh, 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 and use this for causal inference. And uh, I'll mention this also because it's connected to this, uh, these uh, methods of kernel independence testing. Uh, that we've also worked on for a number of years uh, and uh, it's a field that I think maybe Arthur will also talk about in his, his course here. At least I think I've seen that he works, uh, he, he will say something about kernel mean and uh, 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 mac uh, mean maximum mean discrepancy uh, and you can view the kernel independence test as a special case of maximum mean discrepancy. So they're, they're using this kernel mean embedding which I think Arthur will, will tell you about in detail. Uh, this is a very elegant method of embedding a distribution, uh, it, it could be a joint distribution of many variables, into a Hilbert space. So a distribution gets mapped to one point in the Hilbert space. And then the idea for independence testing will be, and for a particular type of kernels, uh, if the kernel is sufficiently nonlinear or sufficiently rich, it will turn out you don't lose any information by doing this embedding. So you now have a, an alternative representation of your distributions in a Hilbert space, and you can start doing linear algebra with your distributions uh, and, and lots of interesting things. And uh, if we apply this to a particular case where we embed both a joint distribution of two variables and the product of two marginal distributions, then we can simply measure the distance between the two embeddings. So the distance between this embedding and this embedding and it turns out that this distance is uh, zero if and only if these two things are identical. In other words, if and only if X is independent of Y. Okay, so this, uh, won't go into details on this, and maybe I will also uh, skip this one, and instead uh, tell you now about uh, another uh, method to uh, distinguish between cause and effect, and this method now will be closer to uh, this uh, independent mechanism assumption that I, I talked about yesterday. Um, so, so remember again, so the two variable case looks like this. We have a cause, we have an effect. Uh, the cause we identify with its noise distribution, uh, and then the, uh, the effect will be a, uh, a function of the cause and its noise distribution. And uh, uh, this function together with noise distribution, we can, also, we can also think of this thing actually as the conditional of effect given cause. So I, as I mentioned, a conditional is just a noisy function if you want. Um, and now we're going to assume uh, a different form of independence. There's no longer an independence of noise terms. 
uh, but it will be an independence in the sense that uh, these are two separate modules of, of nature. So the distribution over the course uh, should tell us nothing about the, uh, the distribution of effect given the course because it's a separate mechanism of nature that doesn't care about what we feed in. So how can we uh, formalize this and what, what does it mean a little bit more intuitively? And uh, so this is the, the intuitive uh, uh, slide. Um, let's assume we have x causing y and we feed in some uh, density over x as an input. So this is, if you want, our input mechanism or our input preparation. And uh, we assume that there's a nonlinear function that generates the output from the input. And uh, for simplicity, we will even assume that this function is not noisy. So our mechanism is simply this function. It has to be nonlinear, so it's uh, non-trivial. If we do this, so we start with some generic input, we apply this nonlinear function, then it turns out, uh, just from the way uh, distributions uh, uh, transfer and transform, and I think uh, we had this yesterday, I think Dave Bly was talking about that, uh, in, in when, when you transform distributions, you get the derivative uh, of this function appearing somewhere, or the norm of the derivative. So what you will find is that wherever this function here was flat, all the probability mass that lies between here and here will actually be concentrated in a relatively small area of the output just because this function is flat here. So that means the output density that's implied by applying this function f to the input density will have large values wherever this uh, function was relatively flat. I think you probably you get the intuition even if you maybe don't remember the exact details how you can calculate this. So that means uh, somehow this output density carries a footprint of the function. So it's, it depends not just on this input density, but also on the shape of the function. So that's, and, and that's why this is not the same as a, a, so the dependence between a mechanism and a distribution is not the same as the dependence between two random variables, because the dependence of between two random variables is not changed by applying a invertible function. Uh, so here we have a dependence between the shape of the overall distributions. It carries a footprint of this function. And uh, it's just there's a certain asymmetry here that this density carries a footprint of this function, whereas this one doesn't. Now, of course, if I start it here and I choose a generic distribution here, propagate it through this function backwards, then suddenly I would see a footprint here. So, so strangely, it seems I see the footprint um, on the output side if if I have an input which is generic, because I could also use this as an input, propagate it backwards, and then suddenly I get something that doesn't carry a footprint of this. So I have to start with something generic, go through the function, uh, and then I'll end up uh, with something that's no longer generic. Uh, so if we're willing to assume that the true model is such that input and mechanism are independent, then we should be able to to tell the causal direction uh, by looking for dependencies between the output and the mechanism. So that will be the idea. And one can formalize this um, and uh, formalize the postulate of independence of mechanism. So in this case, we will simply say, uh, we assume that the covariance between the input density and this particular function of the, of the, of the mechanism should be zero. So. Um, it, the formulas turn out to be nicer if we take the log here, but I think you'll, you'll see that why we want to use the derivative of f, because the derivative of f is going to be what, what should be correlated uh, with this value uh, uh, when there is a dependence. So we assume that uh, in the input, where we assume independence, this covariance should vanish. So it turns out if we are willing to uh, assume this, then, um, and here one has to be a bit precise mathematically. So we, in this case, we view, it's a bit confusing, we view the density as a random variable on a certain probability space, which formally we can do. So we have two random variables, the density and the log of f prime. Anyway, if we assume this uh, uh, independence, then we can prove that unless the function is the identity, the independence will be strictly violated in the backward direction. So that suddenly we have an asymmetry and we can write down estimators to, to estimate this quantity and use it to decide. And, uh, and we can also um, sort of analyze this uh, assumption um, 
the assumption this independence turns out to be uh, uh, equivalent to some some nice uh, formulas uh, in the information space um, but I think I will uh, I will skip this now okay so so now we have there are several methods we have the additive noise method we have this uh, independent mechanisms method and we've collected a number of data sets with cause effect pairs so data sets where we think uh, we know what is cause, what is effect, and uh, we check if the methods correctly detect this. And uh, here are some examples. So the altitude, temperature, I already told you about. But then there's all other data sets like, uh, uh, I don't know, the, the uh, for instance, the, a yeah, the age of a person can have a causal influence on the, uh, the wage because people tend to get salary increases over time. Uh, but the wage cannot have a causal influence on the age. If you get a salary raise, that doesn't change your age. So th there's a number of data sets like this. And uh, uh, we can look at, so by the way, so there, uh, I can maybe tell this story. A, a colleague in Finland once uh, who's also into causality, he was working with some biologists and they analyzed some, some data sets. And uh, uh, they, the biologists didn't ask for that, but they felt that since they have this nice data set, why not, why not also run some causal discovery algorithms? And they found some results that looked interesting, but then some that looked not so convincing. For instance, it turned out that the, uh, the, the length of the fish had a causal influence on the age of the fish, which seems funny the other way around. W would make sense maybe, but so people were laughing about this until uh, finally my, my colleague had this uh, sudden uh, intuition and asked the fish, uh, asked the biologists, how do you actually determine the age of the fish? And they said, it's simple, we just measure their length. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is, uh, this is now the results. Uh, and in a nutshell, if, you, if we were to do, if your algorithm consisted of random guessing, then you would expect in 95% of the cases to be in this gray area. So let's start over here. So this is if we force the algorithms to always decide, uh, even if the algorithm is very unsure, um, then uh, 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 we, we get those numbers here. So this method that I just talked about at the end uh, has maybe around 80% correct, which is nice. Uh, the additive noise method um, is not so strong if we force it to always decide, but if we allow that it rejects some cases and only decides when it's sure, then it actually gets gets rather accurate. So uh, let me not go into great detail on this, but the basic message is the problem is uh, not unsolvable, even though the assumptions are probably not true. The assumption of additive noise is probably not true. The assumption of independent mechanisms may not be exactly true, um, but this problem that people considered uh, unsolvable uh, is probably solvable to some degree. Okay, so um, now this, it turns out that this uh, also has <coughs> implications for machine learning, and I'll tell you about my favorite implication now, which is uh, uh, related to transfer and semi-supervised learning. And this is, uh, the idea here is, let's think about uh, machine learning uh, in the context of causality, and let's think about what does it uh, help us in machine learning if we know something about the causal structure of a problem. We usually don't care about this in machine learning, uh, but we so we wrote this paper uh, seven years ago, uh, ICML, where we said let's start with the simplest case, two variable case again, and assume that the causal structure is uh, one of the following two: either we are trying to we have a machine learning problem where we are trying to predict uh, effect from cause, which means this structural equation model that generates the data is such that our direction of prediction is aligned with the direction of causation. Turns out this is uh, maybe not the standard, I guess, if one doesn't think about it much, one would think maybe that should be the generic case in machine learning. It turns out more often uh, uh, we're doing the opposite thing, that we are predicting uh, the cause from the effect. So for instance, in handwritten digit recognition, uh, the way the digits were generated is someone thinks in the brain, I'm going to generate a digit three, and then the image of the three is the effect, whereas the, the class label was the cause. Um, so in this case, prediction is in the opposite direction uh, from uh, the data generating mechanism or from the causation. Uh, 
Now, what does what does this imply uh, for machine learning if we are willing to make certain causal assumptions? And the assumption that I'm going to make is uh, the independence of the uh, distribution over the cause and the mechanism, so the conditional of effect given cause. So let's assume we have this form of independence and let's remember in this simple setting that we just talked about, if we assume this dependence to, to hold true in the causal direction, then we expect to have dependence in the opposite direction. So if we do the decomposition in the opposite direction, the two terms should depend on each other. Okay, so now uh, let's first look at the direction of causal learning. So both directions are aligned, causation and prediction. Let's call this causal learning, the other thing anti-causal learning. So let's look at causal learning. Uh, now we have our uh, independence of mechanisms assumption. In this case, X is the cause, Y is the effect. So that means our independence assumption simply says P of X is independent of P of Y given X. So that means in particular, so you probably you all know uh, semi-supervised learning. So what does semi-supervised learning do? Or maybe first of all, what does all prediction do? Prediction estimates a property of uh, P of Y given X. So for instance, if we do regression, we estimate the conditional expectation of Y given X. Uh, so we're interested in, in learning about this thing here. Now in semi-supervised learning, uh, we want to come up with algorithms that improve our estimate of this thing by having additional data from this here, or maybe even all data. If we have full access, that's the ultimate form of semi-supervised learning, full access to P of X, how can this help us in estimating this thing? Well, the answer here, in, in this case here, it, it should not help us, because if this object and this object are independent, even complete knowledge of this shouldn't improve what we're going to do here. So the prediction would be in this setting, uh, semi-supervised learning should be impossible. Uh, now, if we look at another problem, which is transfer learning, uh, then the prediction would be actually this should be relatively easy here, uh, because if this object P of X and the condition of P of Y given X are independent objects of nature, uh, now if we do transfer and if we are willing to make what people call the covariate shift assumption, the covariate shift assumption uh, 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 simply says that uh, this thing here should be invariant across different data sets. So if we're willing to make this assumption and we're just changing this thing here, that would be perfectly consistent with expecting that we should do reasonably well by doing standard covariate shift algorithms. Uh, so if we, or maybe I said this in a slightly complicated way, so if we have a transfer setting where two data sets uh, 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 differ by the margin of P of X, uh, whereas these things are the same, then we should be fine. Now, in the opposite direction, anti-causal learning, it should basically be the other way around. In this case, remember, uh, uh, we had a simple setting where I said, if we're willing to assume independence in the forward direction, then we should get strict dependence in the backward direction. So now we are suddenly in the backward direction, which means that P of Y and P of X given Y uh, sorry, uh, P of X and P of Y given X should be dependent. So that means uh, semi-supervised learning should be in principle possible. So because knowing about this thing should help us gain knowledge about this. And uh, I can, and it should be, it would be the other round for, for transfer, but let me say a bit more about semi-supervised learning. Uh, interesting thing is all the assumptions that people have come up with uh, without talking about causality, uh, to justify semi-supervised learning actually fit uh, because they are all assumptions about the dependence between this object and this object. So for instance, there's the so-called cluster assumption. The cluster assumption says that let's just assume points that are in the same cluster of the input density should have the same class label. So that means the input density, the, uh, the uh, uh, input density, the shape of the input density gives us information about the shape of the conditional because we assume the conditional is actually constant within clusters of P of X. Uh, and there's uh, other assumptions such as low density separation assumption or the semi-supervised smoothness assumptions. All of these are assumptions about a link between this and this. And, uh, and also the results turn out nicely. So this was a paper where we didn't run any experiments, but we, we looked at experiments that people had, had run and we simply had to class categorize their data sets into what is, uh, 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 what is uh, causal, what is anti-causal, what is confounded. And 
the results were nicely consistent. I'm maybe running out of battery here. Um, if it gets too annoying, you tell me. Okay, so results were, were very nicely uh, uh, consistent. For instance, here, this is a, a, a setting. People use a particular kind of semi-supervised uh, learning strategy called self-training. And uh, whenever we had a, a causal problem, the red ones were the causal problems, then basically we never get improvements. Uh, whereas we do get improvements, or other people do get improvements for the uh, anti-causal or confounded problems. Okay. So uh, now I could maybe I will I will actually skip skip this, although that's a pity. Uh, so I'll just briefly mention uh, one can. So I've talked a lot about uh, structural equation models and what kind of statistical models they imply. Um, but uh, uh, the, the implications of causality don't always have to be statistical ones. They could also be other implications. So you can also, you can start with a set of structural equations, which is maybe even closer to this idea that they're actually assignments. Uh, and in this case, we just imagine we have a Turing machine and uh, we use the same Turing machine for each node. And the input of the node is a, uh, uh, or the, the node runs some program encoded by this uh, term u, which before was noise variable, and uh, it takes as inputs the values of the parents, and then we run this overall computation. Now we have to measure dependence in, in other ways, not in statistical ways, but we can measure them in terms of something called con uh, Kolmogorov complexity, uh, conditional Kolmogorov complexity, uh, mutual algorithmic information, etc. And if we do that, we get uh, basically a theory of graphical models that are no longer statistical, but, in, but that replace uh, uh, Shannon entropy with Kolmogorov complexity, and that in principle uh, uh, can be used for inference, and that also give a nice way to think about dependence between mechanisms, because in this case it's just uh, algorithmic dependence. So algorithmic dependence means uh, two strings are algorithmically dependent if by concatenating them and compressing them, you can get uh, you can save bits compared to compressing them separately. So if they share some structure, uh, then they will be dependent. And uh, and this uh, this is a w also has a there's a nice parallel uh, to physics that may maybe I'll tell you about this very briefly because it's quite nice I think. Um, and it's an implication for thermodynamics. In this case, uh, we assume we have a beam of particles, so we think of this as the cause. Uh, they are scattered at an object. The object now is the mechanism, and this object is a non-trivial mechanism because it has a non-trivial shape. And then the outgoing beam, beam these uh, scattered arrows here, uh, so that's the effect. It, it contains information about the object, obviously. Uh, otherwise, vision would be impossible, right? The outgoing beams have to contain information about the object. Um, and uh, 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 so the, uh, there's a certain asymmetry here. The incoming, the cause, contains no information about the mechanism, but the effect does. Uh, now, of course, microscopically, the time evolution is reversible in physics. The Schrodinger equation, etc., are reversible. Uh, nevertheless, it looks like the photons contain information only after the scattering, but not before. So that's somehow confusing. Uh, and so uh, and it's equivalent to this question of why photography shows the past rather than the future. And um, the reason is uh, uh, the independence principle. Uh, and we can formulate this in terms of uh, algorithmic independence. So here we just assume S is the initial state, the incoming beam. M is the dynamics, uh, so the shape of the object, etc. And uh, then we postulate that the, the incoming beam uh, is independent of the properties of the object here. Um, and uh, if we assume this, and this here is this plus means it's up to a constant because Kolmogorov complexity is only defined up to a constant. Uh, if we're willing to assume this, then we can actually prove that the time evolution is such that the uh, Kolmogorov complexity will increase uh, over time. So it's a, this is a non-decreasing quantity, and actually it's a quantity that in modern physics people often use as a measure for, for entropy, in which case this is uh, the second law of thermodynamics. Or it's the, it gives us the thermodynamic arrow of time. Okay, so uh, here's another uh, uh, nice 
application, but maybe I'll skip this one. So this is an application of causal modeling to the field of exoplanet uh, discovery. So it turns out we, so we came up with algorithms that uh, use causal modeling to uh, uh, reduce uh, systematic noise sources in uh, uh, astronomical data um, by modeling them as a causal graph. And uh, this causal graph is such that the measurements, so we measure a lot of stars, so there's here X and Y are two of them, but we measure, uh, I think, hundreds of thousands at the same time. Uh, now it turns out that this each star is influenced both by the astrophysical signal out in space, where we want to detect so-called so transits, where a planet passes in front of the star, and by noise sources due to the instrument itself. And it turns out that uh, if different stars, and this is one star, that's another star that's light years away, if they share certain characteristics in their time curves, then uh, these uh, characteristics must be due to the confounding by the instrument. So, and here we have a method that removes this instrument confounding and then leaves us with something which is closer to the original signal. And uh, if you're interested in this, I encourage you to read it because there are some nice theoretic results about what we can reconstruct. And in the end, we, we used it and discovered, uh, it doesn't say here, I think we discovered around 15 exoplanets together with our astronomy collaborators. Okay. Let's see what else we've got. Yeah, so I wanted to get to this uh, last thing uh, very briefly, maybe in the last five minutes or so. Or I, w I think we also started a little bit later, so maybe I can take 10. Um, because people asked about links between causality and deep learning. And uh, so I want to show this one application, which is about one such link. Um, okay, so we talked a lot about uh, this decomposition about the robust uh, conditionals uh, actually and this has been used in, in a number of different uh, settings and now I want to briefly talk about this uh, setting which is connected to, to deep learning and uh, yeah so maybe maybe just briefly again so we, we think an overall model should be factorized in the causal way and if we do that then these components should tend to be robust across different tasks. So different tasks should share such components. And if we move from one task to a related one, then we would expect that in the causal factorization, not everything will change. And that's a specific feature of the causal factorization, because if you take a non-causal, just a purely mathematical factorization, and you change one physically meaningful thing, then this change will somehow propagate on all terms. Uh, but this Factorization is such that these elements are physically meaningful. So for typical changes between different problems, changes should be physically meaningful. They should be due to one physical noise term taking different values, etc. Maybe one mechanism being slightly different, but they should be localized changes. So I think in the end, uh, uh, so my dream would be to learn models of the world that uh, are factorized like this and have this property and uh, that are such that maybe some components uh, can benefit from learning across tasks, whereas others uh, are only trained on some of the tasks. And I think humans, uh, we learn like that too, and animals. And this is one particular such setting where uh, the components that we want to learn are uh, certain transformations of, of images or digits in this case. So the idea is um, we have uh, data from the MNIST set. Uh, we apply a set of different mechanisms uh, to the data to generate noisy data, inverted data, or shifted data. And uh, now we want to learn these uh, mechanisms. So we, have, we don't label the points by how they were transformed, uh, but we now want to train a system that will automatically extract these transformations, uh, and learn these transformations, and ideally in a way that can be trans transferred to new problems. And uh, the idea will be a, a, a form of a competition of, of experts. So we have uh, an overall network that consists of a set of experts. Each expert can do some transformation of a digit. And the experts will now try to undo the transformation of the input digit. So each of these experts will get a go at the transformed example, produce an output. And then uh, we will uh, 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 compare this output or maybe a set of such outputs uh, 
uh, via a discriminator uh, to the uh, original set of MNIST digits. So we will uh, uh, check which of these output looks most like a real digit. Uh, and then, crucially, that output, that expert that has produced the, this best output will be retrained to get better at making this a realistic digit. So it works a little bit like a, like a gun. So these experts try to produce realistic digits from transformed images, so not just from noise, but from tr transformed digits. And then over time, they will specialize uh, to different of these transformations. And since, or if these transformations were independent to begin with, in the sense that uh, doing, on well doing well on one transformation doesn't give you an edge at solving one of the other ones, then uh, there should be a form of specialization happening that uh, if this expert specializes here on removing noise, then this expert should not be good at uh, uh, centering digits, etc. And this is what, what happens in the end. So if we look at the training process, we see that there's a specialization uh, uh, going on. So each plot is a mechanism to be learned and each color is an expert. And you can see that uh, in the end, uh, uh, for each task, there's one expert that's, that's very well specialized. Uh, the learning happens quite fast, actually. And in the end, then if we take uh, random inputs, we feed them through the network, we get these nice outputs, and the experts always decide correctly what to do. And um, so in this case, we then take, uh, so if we, if we uh, take a standard con ConfNet uh, trained to do MNIST digit recognition, and we feed it with the transformed digits, the performance is quite poor, around 40%. Of course, it cannot uh, classify the inverted digits, et cetera. Uh, and if we use now our network as a pre-processing module, then already after relatively few iterations, and I think each iteration is training on 32 digits, uh, we get to a performance that's as good as uh, the original MNIST. So, and uh, what's nice is that this system also uh, generalizes uh, to other clients of uh, uh, digits. So here these are the so-called omniglot uh, characters. So this is, has never been trained on those. Okay, so this is a, a way to learn these mechanisms in an unsupervised way, uh, transferable to related tasks. And, and also, uh, I think it should be also, it's, it's a modular structure in the sense that if you something new comes up, you just have to add a new mechanism. Um, so I think it's, it's not so unrealistic and it can be extended. Um, let's see. And I also want to, I have a few slides at the end of open problems, so I think I'm going to skip this. Uh, it's a little bit related to something that we talked about yesterday about counterfactual manipulation and understanding deep learning systems by counterfactual manipulation. So I think there's an archive, I think we put it in the archive uh, uh, by uh, doing certain sort of grouping manipulations in the hidden layers according to what effect they have on the output and then gives us a representation that's modular in the sense that if we can mix uh, uh, different examples in a meaningful way. Um, I also have two slides here that I won't go through on uh, causality and fairness. Um, and instead, I'll, uh, yeah, I'll finish with, uh, so I'll revisiting. So this is, uh, I showed a related slide yesterday and uh, yeah, I talked to Ferns about this afterwards. I can't quite decide which one I like more, the one from yesterday or this one. Um, so again, here, so we have the differential equation model, the gold standard in physics. We have a statistical model, which is sort of as far away from physics as possible. This one can be learned from data, this one probably not. And then there's the causal models in between. And now, uh, one of the interesting things that, that I think a causal model should be able to do eventually is uh, it should support uh, something that Konrad Lorenz uh, called acting in an imagined space. So Konrad Lorenz, a famous uh, eth Austrian ethologist, uh, uh, so animal behavior researcher, uh, he said that thinking is nothing but acting in an imagined space. So in the end, if we want to build AI, we have to build systems that can think, not just systems that do pattern recognition. So we need systems that support the notion of acting in an imagined space. And I think uh, having systems that take a digit and do some transformations to a digit maybe is a very simple way of 
manipulating data. So you need representations that support manipulation, that support intervention. And I think uh, this is something where we have to leave the realm of purely uh, statistical models. So we need some notions of causality in these models. And uh, so I have two uh, last slides of maybe, maybe some open problems uh, or dreams. Uh, I made those. There was an IPS workshop and the organizers asked us to, to end with some slides of what we think should be done. So first of all, uh, for, for some time, I've had this dream that we should, you know, we, we should model the world, or at least some aspects of the world, by a large multi-task, multi-environment structural causal model. So you should have such models which are learned from data from multiple tasks in multiple environments. Uh, they should automatically decide which component applies to which environment, which component can be trained on which data, on which task. And I think one way to think about that or think in this direction is competitive mechanisms. So you could have, if you think of your brain as a set of many different mechanisms, then uh, whenever some data comes in, you could think that they all have a go and something manages to make sense out of the data and then that something should also be retrained and then gradually specialized. And this way you can imagine a, a sort of an unstructured brain gradually building modules that work well uh, for different tasks. And if these modules correspond to physically meaningful independent mechanisms, then these modules should also be such that they generalize across tasks. So that's the one um, dream. I think representation sh learning should move uh, in this direction. I already talked about that. I mentioned Conard Lawrence. Uh, I think it would be very interesting to understand adversarial vulnerability in this way, uh, and, and I would I would hypothesize that uh, a little bit like in the case of semi-supervised learning, that causal direction should play a role uh, for adversarial vulnerability. So I would expect that vulnerability should occur much more strongly for anti-causal or, or confounded conditionals, uh, whereas the causal conditionals that model effect given cause should be much more robust uh, also to these kinds of attacks. Um, I think it's also particularly interesting to think about uh, causality and reinforcement learning, um, because there are some things that, at least in the past, uh, were slightly annoying, but probably still, about uh, reinforcement learning. For instance, it's, it's strange that uh, uh, one should make a problem easier, like such as the Atari setup, um, by downsampling images, because for, for us as a human, the problem gets harder if we have a blurry game screen. So these uh, problems should not suffer from that, and I think the reason they suffer from it bec is because they don't have the right interventional way of defining what is an object. So if we play a video game and we move the, the joystick and we see that there's a set of pixels that responds to our commands and that responds in a, in a common way, then we group these things together and make it a causal uh, object or something that supports meaningful localized intervention. So I think we need to understand that. Um, and uh, it's also slightly frustrating that uh, uh, sometimes people have to permute data to do reinforcement learning. Uh, so in the original Atari paper, uh, uh, people had to s store past experiences, then permute them and retrain the system, and they likened it to uh, replay during dreams. So give it some biological motivation. Um, I think that's also confusing for us as humans. It would be very hard to learn such a video game from permuted data. Uh, the reason why we permute data as a community is because we try to squeeze everything into the IID scenario um, uh, rather than exploiting uh, non-IID behavior. And in the end, uh, I think the way to exploit non-IID behavior is to look for uh, non-stationarities and find out what's invariant across the different tasks. And that's something that's also in the realm of, of causality. So I think uh, uh, causality should give us the right ways of exploiting this kind of structure. And, and finally, uh, uh, I think the role of invariance we haven't understood yet. Uh, it's an old idea in causality, and I think as a community we're, we're getting closer to understanding it. Uh, I think it could be quite interesting to also connect it to reinforcement learning and, and for instance, uh, 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 view it as 
as one way to, to uh, of, of intrinsic motivation of a learning algorithm so that people, I think we as humans do this too and animals uh, and, and our children do this, that we look for repetitive structure, invariant structure that we think can generalize. So I think at this point, uh, I've bothered you long enough. Uh, if you're interested in more details, we have a book. Uh, this book is also on the web. You don't have to buy it. Um, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>